or um pr pr probably on the end would be better okay it, it's gonna it's gonna be a and be moot everybody else it's going to be a rush to get through all this okay. in that much time. so go ahead and mute everyone and i will unmute myself all right yes They are all muted, so that's good. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Okay. Now, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Very good. All right. So, um, if I can get the right view on this, we're going to go with a slideshow view. And you should be looking at a slide that says how to make garbage into food, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Perfect. So <clears throat> this is a PowerPoint that I did for the uh, Northwest Permaculture Convergence in uh, 2019 originally. Somebody has a chat. So uh, I'm a mushroom cultivator and uh, I got into this kind of uh, several ways. I was trying to use up my byproducts and uh, however, this actually started out as more of a spiritual quest. So here's, here's how I turn garbage into food. I use straw to grow mushrooms, and I use the mushroom straw, the kitchen scrap to grow red wiggler worms, um, use branches and such off of uh, the trees, uh, especially fruit trees, uh, to, to heat the water. And charcoal is a byproduct, and I use worm castings and charcoal to make uh, an anthropogenic soil that I call squim terra preta. And I grow organic vegetables in that. Well, when I was young, my goal was to be a great prophet. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd speak great truths, but of course no one would listen. And as Charlie Brown said, why bother? This is going to make well, cheesy. we prophets are very stubborn. Unfortunately, uh, when I was, uh, I think, seven, when I decided I wanted to do this, my reason for being a prophet was I wanted to be able to call fire down on my head. Well, it turned out that as I read further in the Bible, because I just barely learned how to read back then, that uh, God wasn't really into vengeance that much. He was more into mercy and forgiveness and things like that. So that, that, that kind, of <clears throat> kind of foiled my intent. But I thought, well maybe I'm not exactly sure what I want. And is God going to honor that? I don't know that God honors wishy-washy. I read back in the Old Testament about a guy named Payne. I had heard in, on the radio about a book called The Prayer of Jabez. Uh, Jabez is uh, a Hebrew for pain. And he prayed this prayer. He pray, prayed, bless me abundantly, enlarge my borders, guide me, and keep me from pain. Well, oddly enough, his name was pain. So he was actually praying that God keep him from himself. But I thought, <laughs> maybe I would uh, pray, pray that prayer and, and, and see what happened. Well, this is like the most boring part of the Bible. Now, I've read through the Bible so many times, I can definitively tell you something is not in the Bible. And this is a part that's hard to get through, I have to tell you. It's mostly who was born, how they, when they lived, who their offspring was. If you look down in verse 9, I'm going to go in on that. Jabez, uh, Hebrew for pain, was more honorable than his brothers. His mothers had named him pain saying I gave birth to him in pain and he cried out to the God of Israel oh bless me enlarge my territory let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so I will be free of pain and God granted his request that's what got my attention now, I thought well would work for Jabez work for me and I well there's no harm in trying so Instead of praying, God, I want whatever I want, 
I started saying, God, between the two of us, you're the smarter. I'm going to leave it up to you. You bless me abundantly. And I'll just watch for the blessings. I had no idea how God would bless me. But that's the time I That's really annoying. Somebody has a Somebody here. The mute thing not. All right. So, so I forgot the time I joined KPMS. And Mine's turned off. I ended up blessed with wild mushrooms. Uh, we went morale picking. I learned how to find morales. I actually found some pretty big morales. Uh, eventually, I even cultivated morales. I ended up with six about that big. Uh, they were tasteless. They tasted like cardboard. I don't know why the cultivated morels were not flavorful when the wild ones are. However, <clears throat> I have an idea because when we're up in the mountains, every time I find a morel, if I can touch the mushroom with one hand, I can touch an alpine strawberry with the other. And so my guess is they may have some kind of a relationship with the alpine strawberries that makes them flavorful. Because the ones I grew in, in the bark you see behind me in the yard, they were not flavorful. I was blessed with matsutake. And as you can see on the table, there are also some cauliflower mushrooms. I really, really enjoyed foraging for mushrooms. Uh, but I was always out. It seemed like by the time matsutake season came around next year, they were all gone. Uh, same with morels, same with chanterelles. I, I never had enough. Then I learned that uh, mushrooms will grow anywhere. That shiitake on that kit was grown on the planet in the background there. <laughs> so I started growing and selling mushroom kits. I sell that size for $10. And uh, if you were to order them online, you'd probably pay $10 shipping on a kit that large. So that's why I advocate buying local, also because I'm the local supplier. <laughs> uh, so, but look at the size of those uh, shiitake on there. That's about what I was getting on straw. Then I had the, this larger kit that I threw out on my bone pile and forgot about it. It turned green and black and every other bacteria scum growing on it and it grew these huge shiitake. They are some of the best tasting mushrooms I have ever eaten. So I'm finding out that growing shiitake under absolutely clean environments like works so well with oyster mushrooms uh, apparently is counterproductive and I need to actually grow them in an environment where some of these other bacteria and things live. Uh, I, I'm only just barely learning that. According to the literature, uh, shiitake do not grow on straw. Fortunately for me, mushrooms can't read, so they don't know that. Um, this is the mushroom of love, Pleurotus de Jamor. This is the first mushroom that I cultivated. They're particularly beautiful. Um, they're prolific. They'll grow in the heat of the summer. Um, it's one of the reasons I grow them is because by the time those are fruiting well, the other oyster mushrooms have gone dormant because it's too hot or dry. These mushrooms will fruit up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit as long as the humidity is up around 90%. Now, I wouldn't particularly want to live in 100 degrees and 90% humidity, but those mushrooms flourish there. In nature, those would be decomposing uh, dead rubber trees. That, that's their, their place. This is a close-up of the Mushroom of Love. You can see that striation in there. Um, they're particularly beautiful. Another really beautiful mushroom that I grow is, uh, this is Pleurotus ostriatus strain Florida. Um, and Florida in this case means, uh, it, it is Latin for flowery or floral. And you can see how it looks like uh, some watercolor artists spent about an hour on each mushroom cap drawing in all that beautiful detail. They're, they're just a beautiful mushroom. This is one of the largest mushrooms that I've ever grown. This is a king oyster mushroom. It's Pleurotus orangii. That uh, upper mushroom in that picture, I sold that single mushroom for $17. 
at uh, twenty dollars a kilo. Hmm. This blue cap oyster mushroom, Pleurotus columbinus. This is probably my most flavorful mushroom. It is a prolific grower. It grows on straw without any additives, just plain straw and water, does fine. This is a column of blue cap oyster mushrooms uh, that were in my grow room. This is a picture that I use in my uh, website. This mushroom kit was grown by Anna Jones. It was packed by her when she was five years old. And so <clears throat> if you're little and you wanna make little mushroom kits, that works too. This is what I think is the most flavorful mushroom. I eat over 50 species of mushrooms and this is my very favorite one. And I'll bet you're all looking at that going, ooh, oh, I know exactly what that is, right, right? <laughs> The uh, see the scales on the stems, those are foliota. Here's a more mature one. Hmm. They have a slimy cap, those are foliota nomico. Now, if you are out in the woods and you find a foliota, don't eat it, okay? Um, foliota are poisonous how the Asians figured out that this one foliota was edible, I have no clue, but they did, and they are wonderful. Um, the common English name for them is the slime foliota, uh, but their common name is Namiko, which is Japanese for slimy, uh, and they certainly are. The slime cooks away, um, so you don't really have to deal with that when you eat it, and they are flat out delicious. This is Hypsozygus almerius, uh, the mushroom that uh, Kirsten showed us earlier before I started this talk. Uh, if you grow them outdoors, they look a little bit thicker, have a heavier uh, duty uh, fruiting body. Um, you can always tell a Hypsozygus from a Pleurotus because the gills actually end and there's a little bit of stem below the gills. Yeah. A Pleurotus, the gills run all the way back to the tree. Yeah. This is the Pleurotus ostriatus florida grown outdoors. It's still got that beautiful striation, but the, um, the skin of the mushroom, the, the, the upper cap is much darker, but still again striated. So you can tell it's the Florida strain. Well, eventually when I uh, grow mushrooms, they deplete all the straw and I throw them out in a big pile and it looks really nasty. In fact, my wife points out to me that it looks nasty and she will say eventually, "Lo, you can't just leave those out there. The neighbors don't know they're not full of pampers. And I go, oh, you know, because they do look pretty bad. So back when, back when I lived in Bremerton, before I figured out what to do with them really, I would load them up on a truck and pay somebody to take them off my hands. When I did that, I would notice this layer of really super black soil underneath, and uh, there would be all these uh, worms trying to get away, these red wiggler worms. Uh, somebody in, uh, a friend of mine in Bremerton told me that those worms were worth a lot of money, and I didn't exactly believe that, and so I didn't pursue it until later. But one of the things I did try to do with these kits was I had built a raised bed out of them, and planted my tomato plants in the middle there. And you can see those tomato plants look just kind of like garden variety tomato plants. I had not discovered squim terra preta at the time, but I picked five pounds of uh, blue cap oyster mushrooms off the, the straw raised bed. We also used the straw to uh, just take up space in the bottom of taller wooden raised beds that we used. So we were able to get really good tasting mushrooms that weren't uh, covered with straw because they grow out the cracks between the, the boards there. Now, I, it was a good thing I started uh, just looking for blessings and not specifying them because I doubt that I would ever, ever in my lifetime ask God to bless me with that. <laughs> that is five gallons of worm poop. 
Those are made by these red wiggler worms, Isenia fetida. This is an upward migrating bin that I built with instructions off the internet. Works fine for the worms, but it takes two people to pick up the bins because once they're full of uh, castings, they're, they're too heavy for one person to pick up without injuring your back. Um, so I started growing them in plastic bins. Again, the ones in the back were, were too large. They got too heavy. Um, but the five gallon ones work fine, except they got top heavy and they would tip over. So I started making a little concrete bases to keep them from tipping over. Well, so not only was I blessed with worm castings, here I am dumping them out in the backyard to, to separate the worms out and, and use the, the castings in the soil. But I was blessed with them, with charcoal, and with some really smart friends. So every time I make a batch of straw, I pasteurize the straw, uh, I use a top lid updraft, and that's a byproduct, about three gallons or so of charcoal, that's biochar. Norm, uh, or uh, Francesco Tortorici, the gentleman on the left, uh, showed me how to make the uh, device that's in the middle there. That's a top lit up draft. That's a single burner hot plate for a 55 gallon drum. And the insides of that are gasifying wood. And that flame that Norm is pointing his thermometer at there is, uh, is wood gas. And there is absolutely no smoke you can stand in the exhaust of that thing and your eyes don't water, it burns that clean. Well, the, the point of it wasn't to, for low pollution, although that's a really good result. It gets twice as much heat per unit wood as an open fire. So I built it for the efficiency so I could, I could get more heat out of my wood. So I have been blessed with squim terra preta. Let me explain that. Terra preta literally means black earth it, or black land in Portuguese. Um, it was anthropogenic soil from the Amazon basin. It has a lot of charcoal in it and uh, organic material. <clears throat> it's the world's most nourishing soil. But for the most part, the soil scientists don't know too much about it. It was man-made, but unfortunately, all the people that knew how to make it, make it uh, died when the Europeans came over and introduced uh, smallpox. And essentially, 100 years later, they were all gone. And the only thing left of their civilization were these huge pits of this, this deep soil. Um, this was a, a, a dig from one of their places where they had, um, this is along the Amazon, uh, the natural soil is useless because all the nutrients get uh, washed away. And uh, in, in the jungle, all the, uh, the, the carbon, all, all of the biomass is locked up in, in the canopy. And so there really isn't much in the soil. And so they actually made this soil. And you can see how deep that is there, about, about five feet. Well, terra preta is 20% charcoal, but that's not the only soil in the world that's 20% charcoal. Iowa, where the tall corn grows, uh, I looked up how tall a uh, 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 John Deere 90, 9750 or 9150, whatever that is. And that corn is just about 14 feet tall there. That's from Iowa, and that soil is naturally 20% charcoal. Now, when I say naturally, as, as far as the Europeans know, very likely that soil was charcoal because the natives were burning off the prairie every year to keep forests from going there, so they'd have good buffalo and elk hunting. Uh, so this actually may be anthropogenic soil, uh, we don't know for a fact that uh, that black earth occurs without human intervention. 
This is the top lit updraft. That's the innards of that uh, wood gasifying furnace. The channels around the outside let in 20% uh, of the air and the little tube in the middle, let, or 80%, I mean, and the little tube in the middle is 20%. So you have 20% uh, primary, 80% uh, uh, secondary combustion air. You can see the channels that make that work in that little concrete part. So by, by extracting the heat from the wood using that method, I end up with a charcoal. Once I put it through a hammer mill, it looks like that. Uh, if you just mix raw biochar in your garden soil, you'll probably be disappointed because the first thing that all this charcoal does is it soaks up all the beneficial bacteria in your soil. And so for your first year or two, you, you actually are not gonna appreciate having that charcoal in there. In order to not have that happen, we, we charge the charcoal. So we are putting in biocharged biochar. And uh, here again, it's, it's my, my red wiggler worm that provides what we need to do that. Uh, the worms live on the spent mushroom kits and uh, this commodity right here, um, that's worth $2 a pound. <laughs> if you have that at your house and you're not getting $2 a pound for it, it's because you don't have red wiggler worms. <laughs> One of the benefits of those worms is that when you compost with them, you end up with uh, this liquid on the bottom. Some people call it worm tea. Technically, it's, it's leachate, uh, it leaches out from, from the compost, and it is really full of beneficial bacteria. So when I'm about to make squim terra preta, I will pour this leachate into the biochar in an open container and leave it for weeks or months and let that uh, um, charcoal soak up all that beneficial bacteria. That way, when I mix it with the soil, it, it already has bacteria in it and it's not subtracting beneficial bacteria from my soil. So you get a, a benefit from it the first year you use it if you, if you charge it first before you put it in there. So um, Squim Terra Preta is 75% organic material. Again, because we weren't able to actually interview the original makers of Terra Preta, we don't know what went in there, but I know it was organic. And because I had, I was selling red wiggler worms by this time. And I had quite a bit of this, uh, these worm castings left over. I thought, well, I'll use that as the organic component and see if I can make my own Terra Preta. So this is what I did. This is the, um, 75% of a batch of uh, Squim Terra Preta, that's uh, three and three quarters containers of uh, worm castings. <clears throat> There's one container of uh, charged biochar. You can see the black leachate is running out of there. It's been soaking in leachate for months. And the original Terra Preta was 5% pottery shards. Well, I don't know enough potters to come up with that many pottery shards. Um, so I just used masonry sand or really fine sand to mix in there. So there would be some mineral component. Well, it turned out it works. I end up with some really, really nice topsoil as a result of there. Um, I knew I had something going on when I picked over 40 pounds of tomatoes off one tomato plant. Um, so I had my scientist friends come and check that. That's the first crop I ever grew in that raised bed. Uh, that raised bed has deteriorated so far now that uh, uh, it, it's disintegrated and I'm, I'm going to be replacing it this spring. I do have three other raised beds though that I have, uh, have filled with that because in that many years, I ended up with quite a few worm castings. So um, my scientist friends came and did a lab test of that to find out 
what was soil really was. So originally this was in uh, uh, April of 2016. And I commented to them that uh, I had grown seven or eight crops on that raised bed and hadn't added anything to it. And I was getting just as good a crops as I had. Apparently that soil does not diminish when you grow crops on it. Well, they thought that was quite a bold claim. So uh, I think it was Francesco or Norman came over <clears throat> and took another sample on uh, in uh, 2020. Well, I don't understand most of these numbers, but the ones that are in yellow there, the uh, exchange capacity, uh, uh, cation exchange rate, uh, higher numbers are better. And uh, a 15 is roughly five times what you'd find in regular soil. But four years later, it was over 19. Uh, so, you know, nearly seven times what you'd find or six and a half times what you'd find in regular soil. And uh, the organic matter uh, had also gone, gone up. So this tells me that something that was going on between the bacteria and the soil uh, and the plants was actually um, putting organic material uh, <coughs> down into that soil. So here is the formula. If you want to try to make your own squim terra preta, uh, as soon as I learned this, I published it. I, it has been continuously on my website. I did that intentionally so no one could patent it, keep me from doing it. <laughs> I don't care if other people use it. I just don't want anyone trying to keep someone else from using it. So I'm trying to encourage worm, worm growers to do this and to try it themselves. So one of my reasons for trying to get people to make their own organic topsoil that, that arc is uh, um, 1,500 miles from squim. That's the average distance that the food on your table travels in the US. Um, even though broccoli can grow within 20 miles of almost everybody's house, it travels an average of 1,800 miles to get there. That's, that's really not sustainable, but that is, that's a raised bed in my backyard. Uh, I can produce that fertilizer here on the mushroom farm. I can grow vegetables year after year. Uh, now that I realize that the soil doesn't deplete, I am going to have uh, more of the swim terra preta than I can actually use, or I would grow more vegetables than I could eat, uh, even when we put them up for the winter. So, um, so that, that has been amazing. Now, one thing I totally did not expect was after I started eating these vegetables, um, I had had irritable bowel syndrome for 20 years and it went away. And getting over irritable bowel syndrome is a big deal. I find out that most people that have it uh, it's chronic. They they put up with it for years and years. Well, I put up with it for a long time. If I realize what? what's that? So so anyway, I I did not know why I got over the irritable bowel syndrome, but uh, when I was talking about being a prophet of God, I, I, I'm not exactly sure I should share this, but I guess I will. Uh, I have a, a little half bath uh, off my grow room and uh, I had gone in there and uh, had a, a, a really uh, comfortable bowel movement. Well, that's not a big deal unless it's the first time it's happened to you in 20 years. <laughs> and I realized that that didn't hurt. And I walked out and I said, praise God. And at that point, I believe I heard the voice of God say, this isn't just for you, Lowell. And I thought, well, I have no idea how to explain it to somebody else. And I don't even know what happened. And Audrey bought home a book 
and it is uh, called The um, Hidden Half of Nature. Your speaker next month is one of the authors of that book. So I definitely recommend it. That's very uh, cool. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so in that book, it explained why my IBS went away. Uh, Thanks for sharing, Lowell, really. The, the, the bacteria that makes this soil regenerative, that bacteria is the exact same bacteria that needs to live in the upper third of your lower colon in order for you to have good gut health. Well, I was really surprised that the IBS went away, but after it was gone for about six months, several other health issues that I had also got better. I, I quit having the joint pain that I had been having. Now, that was really surprising to me because usually people at my age don't start feeling better. And so I have been really, really impressed with that. So I, I have been, been tr hoping that other people could use the, the health benefits. There's something else that we did at exactly the same time. And so I'm not sure that if it was one or the other, a combination thereof. But um, I, Audrey had had a stroke a few years ago. And the doctor told her that in order to not have more strokes, she needs to quit eating corn sugar. Well, when she quit eating that, I quit eating it too. I think that has something to do with it because in, in, my, um, in my lab, when I'm pouring agar, one of the things that I will put in there to keep bacteria from growing is dextrose. In other words, corn sugar. And it prevents the bacteria from growing by preventing it from forming the mucus that it needs for the bacteria to, to split apart, you know, without spilling their guts when the one cell splits into two cells. If they can't form that mucus, they can't reproduce. And I can get just fungus growing on there because it doesn't bother the fungus at all. But uh, it definitely interferes with the bacteria. And so my guess is that I quit poisoning my gut bacteria at about the time that I started ingesting uh, dirty vegetables out of my raised bed, and that got that growing healthy within me again. Uh, so I'm going to stop the share, and uh, if there are any questions, I would happily answer them. Yeah, this was absolutely awesome, Lowell, and I am clearly also a believer in exactly the same philosophy. So everybody else, if you have questions, please unmute yourself and then ask the question. You can show your mushroom. When is the next time you are, or you think you might be making another batch of that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, instead oh. of making beer, let's, uh, or wine or something like that, honey or whatever, let's, let's make some, Poop. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so, so squint terra preta. Uh, I will be. I will be making some as soon as it warms up here a little bit. I've got quite a, quite a uh, collection of worm castings right now, and I have the biochar ready to go, so I can, I can mix up some. So it's like in the springtime. That's when you start to, or when it starts to warm up. Well, we have been eating lettuce out of one of our raised beds since January 1st. We garden year round in that. Um, that soil in a raised bed with a little plastic cover over it in a mild climate like this, you can grow some of those cold temperature mushrooms anytime. Uh, <clears throat> but, <clears throat> but yes, I will be building a new raised bed and, uh, and I'll be filling it with that, but I will probably have um, probably a, a half of a yard of uh, swim terra preta that I don't have raised beds for. I'd like to, uh, if you don't mind, uh, join you and maybe give you a hand and uh, learn a little something. Sure, that would be great. Uh, you, you saw the, uh, the email address, lowell at deetsfarm.com? Yes, sir. Yeah. Send me an email and I'll, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that happens. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Lowell, I'm a city boy that just moved out to um, the country and I'm just starting to think about growing vegetables and things along those lines. Is there a, is there a book or a, or a place to 
start. I've kind of got space and sun and water and mm -hmm. and time. So I'm just kind of curious how to just begin. Um, I, I would recommend uh, the hidden half of nature. It explains uh, how and why the, the soil bacteria are important and why they're important to your health. Um, and that will be our speaker next uh, month, yeah, other than March. Mm -hmm. But you can, yeah, you can get it online, you know, wherever. The library. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, there Thank are many, you. many gardening books around. Um, too many to get into, but you could actually get a hold of the Master Gardener uh, place at the Norm Dick Center. They also have this online, Master Gardeners, and they can give you uh, free brochures of um, gardening tips, which would be all for our local area. Mm -hmm. this, this particular thing, the, uh, the worm castings and charcoal mixture, <clears throat> that that is so new. I those two soil tests, as far as I know, that I just showed you are the only uh, uh, research or tests has been done of it, except for the fact that I have been growing lots and lots of vegetables, and they're they're really good, and and uh, my health has improved as a result. So I'm I'm kind of an evangelist for gut bacteria now. <laughs> Hey Lowell, I have a question. Do you keep your, do you have to move your red wigglers inside or put them somewhere a little warmer in the winter months? Um, the ones that I do in those, those little uh, five gallon containers, yes, I do move them inside. Uh, I also have two larger composting bins that are, mm, you know, a third to a half of a cubic yard. Um, those are large enough that they're fine outdoors. Uh, I put a whole bunch of mushroom straw in there with them so there's good insulation. And in the cold weather, they just migrate to the inside where it's warm and then they come back out when it, or when it gets cold, I mean, and then they come back out when it gets warm. Um, so they, they do fine in there. But my actual reason for moving my uh, worm condos indoors in the wintertime is that oddly enough the big demand for worms is in the spring and I don't know why particularly um, sometimes people who have had uh, worms will, will leave them out and it gets too cold and they and they freeze and they need to replace them but a lot of people start to think about worm composting in the spring when it's garden season now to me that would be when uh, I, I, I'm really glad I have been composting for a year because then I've got all these cubic feet of, of worm castings to use. But uh, any time is a good time to start with the worms. And by keeping them inside in the wintertime, I have um, thousands and thousands of worms to sell in the spring when, uh, when people want them. So, oh, oddly enough, when I was first told that the worms were worth money, I didn't believe it. Uh, and um, they're only worth about a nickel a piece, um, but I've sold over 92,000. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it, by indoors, do you mean like I could put them in my garden shed or do I have to actually drag them into the garage or uh, as long as it's enclosed? My, my, mine are in the mushroom grow room, which is enclosed. Uh, it's insulated, but it's not heated. So it doesn't ever go below freezing in there but it can get as low as 40 degrees and that's, that doesn't hurt them a bit. Mm. If I can say something, Alex, I have yeah. a, um, the normal kind of mushroom factory thingy, which is such a little green tower for maybe 10 years or longer. I never moved them inside. They are outside. They are close to the house, but they are totally fine. And the reason, you know, I, I don't need that much, like what Lowell produces is like industrial production and we don't have that much veggies. And I also, you know, veggie scraps, I also throw them in a normal compost. Um, so yeah, I just have this little thing, but I don't do anything and they are totally fine. I just saw them today. They looked perfect. Oh, that's good to know because I've wanted to get into vermiculture also. 
but I'm sure a little bit of heat will make them you know multiply faster or whatever so if you have a space it couldn't hurt but mine are hardened they are german red wigglers <laughs> they're tough <laughs> so the, those 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 little towers those four of those five gallon the yeah other, with a concrete base i sell those for a hundred dollars with 500 worms and uh some biochar in the bottom collector so you That's can awesome. charge bleachate as soon as you pull it out of there, it'll be charged. Mine is oh. old. Actually, the plastic is breaking. I'm duct taping it all around. So maybe I need a new one. <laughs> I'm feeling a trip to Squim coming on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what's your price again? They, they sell faster than I can make them. So give me a, a couple days heads up so I have one yeah. ready for you when you get here. Lowell, what is your price again? They're a hundred dollars, including sales tax and the worms. Okay, <laughs> and the worms. Good. Uh, there's no sales tax on on livestock in Washington State. So <laughs> livestock. On the How much is in your herd? <laughs> oh well, let's see. I have between eleven and thousand worms right now. <laughs> Low, well, would it help if they have to be outside? I mean, I have a um, little thing that you can plug in that, that turns on at 35 degrees and turns off at 43. Yeah. And I've been putting light bulbs in it, the ones that warm up still for my plants. And I was wondering if that would work for the mushrooms, kind of, or the worms, warm them up a little bit. Um, it, it, it wouldn't hurt anything. Um... I, I certainly don't pamper mine that well. And, <laughs> and you're in you know, squim. <laughs> my, my, my outdoor ones and my indoor ones have both survived. I have never lost any to freezing, but there are people who live at a bit of higher altitude than I do. Yeah. It's it colder and they have lost outdoor worms to freezing. So, um, but, but I'm right here almost at sea level and, uh, it's pretty mild here. They wouldn't freeze outdoors. Well, you can get those little plugs at the uh, bird, well, bird shop. It's for warming up bird baths and stuff. Oh. So if anybody wanted to, that might work. Okay. I was also wondering, Lowell, do you sell any of the spent mushroom kits? The mushroom straw? I, I do, which is, since I started vermiculture, um, the other worm growers will buy every kit that I don't use myself. Uh, in fact, there's a waiting list to buy them. I sell the large ones for a dollar and the small ones for 50 cents. And this is just between you and me. That's what it cost me to make them. <laughs> so take that in instead of, instead of using shredded newspaper as the dryer bedding in with the worms, the yeah. mushroom castings? Yeah. The spent, the, they thrive. They reproduce like crazy on the yeah. spent mushroom kits. They it, love it. When, when, you, when you bed with those, you, you put your compost material in there. And eventually, if you need to count out some worms, you, you'll dump that compost out on a table and start sorting through there. You'll get to a place where there's some of that mushroom straw that hasn't quite so deteriorated and you can still recognize it and you open it up and there will be worms in there just as tight together as, I mean, hundreds of them in just a little handful. Yeah. So they, they congregate and they live in that mushroom straw. Um, one of the limiting factors to growing uh, worms is protein because you're not supposed to give them eggs, you're not supposed to give them meat, and you're not supposed to give them dairy products. Well, that spent mushroom straw, that chitin uh, is, is a is a protein and those mushrooms will run up to the the spent straw will run up to 30 percent digestible protein so mm -hmm. it's a good protein source for those uh worms <clears throat> where it's hard to get good protein to your worms otherwise cool what do you feed them for protein otherwise um they they just mostly make it on vegetables and, wow. and that's one of the reasons why uh, if you're just growing them on coffee grounds and um, apple cores and uh, on newspaper, yeah. 
you, you'll get some worms, but you start putting in the uh, spent mushroom kits for bedding, right? You the newspaper, uh, you, you, you'll get lots of worms. Wow. That, that's why that's why I've been able to grow so many. Um, yeah, you, 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 you don't you don't sell 90,000 head of livestock off a half acre ranch. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you got something going, <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. Dietz, what would it take to uh, up production uh, of the worms? It sounds like that operation. <laughs> I'm uh, thinking of a big business here already, so I'm sorry. Five <laughs> cents a worm. <laughs> we crawlers when I was like 12 to 14 years old in the summertime in South Dakota, and I used to make $200 a week doing this stuff. I had bait shops coming. Wow. Out. I knew nothing about other than coffee grounds, eggshells, and black and white newspapers. Yep. And I had them into two uh, tubs. But when you're doing the casting and you got other pro byproducts of what you're doing and it's being able to be sold, it was like, you got to, I don't know. <clears throat> I'm sorry. My business mind's going off here. <laughs> Okay, George, you know, I appreciate this so much because uh, I have I have been blessed with information that I was not pursuing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I've, I've come at this kind of backhandedly. Isn't that the way it goes? Well, yeah. but the, the one thing that I have not been able to figure out is how to make money at it. <laughs> so if, you, if you can supply that, I'm I'm all with you on that. I, I'm 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 looking at you know it's like the raised bed garden and the production out of that is the, in itself is just you know that's a big ticket right there. Uh, and I have only been here in Washington for four years, and and I have two little spots at the pea patch here at the Blueberry Park, mm -hmm. um, and I met. Kristen, when we did the mushroom show in 2019, and I'm an OC culinary uh, student. All right. And so there's a, a couple of you here and there that I've seen uh, in, in my passing. And then uh, there's the folks, master gardeners and the beekeepers and all that stuff at the, at the Blueberry Park. But just seeing, uh, you know, gardening here and the soil that we have, and, and it's, it's, it's really just a tremendous place. But being able to amp it up a little bit with new the nutrients that you have in there, which is also a, led to a benef a medical benefit. You know, it's, that's huge. That's it's huge. huge. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, let me give you a hint about, uh, about making money in this business here. Uh, when you make something, it shouldn't cost you as much to make it as it is to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. That doesn't quite make it in business. Now, when you go in a, a secret thing and say, well, you know, it costs me as much to make these as it is to sell it. That doesn't make a lot of profit margin, Lowell. Okay, but <laughs> I, have, something... I have already sold $40 worth of mushrooms off that kit also. Exactly. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but if you add a quarter to every one of those sales, Lowell, it, yeah. it builds up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get word of mouth. 75 cents, a dollar and a quarter. What a deal. Well, you know what the most beautiful thing is, though, is that the between the worms and the mushroom castings and the gardening, you're also contributing to better stewardship of our land so that yes. we eat clean, we take care of the land we live on. It's just a beautiful thing. And that leads exactly. right back into the ability yeah. of our, our community uh, when I took that class. And, you know, when you talk about the food bank, food line, uh, the co op, all of those. The farmers markets and stuff that are around here we you know, you're absolutely right johnny you know when it comes to the stewardship of our our community exactly he's actually doing carbon capture with that because that's one thing you can do is bury it that's and right it's good for the soil that makes that makes my energy use carbon negative <laughs> and you know, here's, here's another thing that i have found out by using the the top lit updraft and making charcoal is I can get free energy. Mm. I, I have people who have uh, wood branches, uh, hardwood, uh, you know, they've trimmed their fruit trees right, and right. they will bring me those branches. I get the heat to pasteurize my straw and uh, they get half the charcoal, so. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. Are they using it as artist charcoal or for other things? Because if you do twigs, you might be able to draw with it. You could do some well, art. It, 
the, the biochar makes really, really good artist charcoal. Right, it's almost right. pure carbon. It's as black as it can be, and it's not messy. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where do I, I buy? I need, uh, to, I need to sign off. I just wanted to thank you before I did that. I, it was a very interesting evening, and I appreciate it, your comments and your wisdom. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for being here. Thank Bob. you for being there. Yeah, thanks, right. Bob. Good, bye -bye. George. Bye. Could you tell me where I can buy oh. mushroom straw? Oh, uh, Mr. Straw? Deeds. <laughs> where can I buy mushroom straw? Do you want to grow mushrooms? No. Um, he would like no, to I would put it in my uh, compost. Oh, okay. It's the last word we don't understand. The yes. spent mushroom straw. Straw. Yes. <laughs> straw. S C R A W. I I I have I have a few for sale, uh, and uh, I I sell like I say the big ones for a dollar, the small ones for. Oh, 50. okay, okay, that's what it was. Okay. Or yeah. if you want to grow your own mushrooms, I'll sell you the mushroom kit, and after okay. you pick your mushrooms, and the kits have quit producing, you can put that in your compost. Um, Excellent. If if you know exactly. like this growing mushrooms. They no, like this. Like the one that Kirsten has there. Wow. If yeah. you know people that are doing that, that are not composting the straw, and you ask them, they'll, they'll probably share the straw with you. Okay. And uh, Lowell, are your kits available year round? Yeah, I, I grow mushrooms all year round. Okay, so how do I come to pick it up? <laughs> to buy it? <laughs> we, are going, we are going to Elwa Campground. Uh -huh. the, for camping and it's in squim how yeah. do i get in touch um did you get my email address there yes i did lowell at deedsfarm.com mm -hmm. send me an email let me know when you're going to be here and how many you want to get and i'll i'll make sure they're here for okay you. if i don't have that many i'll let you know but uh, uh i've got maybe 15 right now okay yeah that's the next thing Lowell, you see now, what do we create? A big demand for your mushroom. So how can we invite <laughs> you to grow a couple more? I would like the blue ones, the Eringii, and also the foliota. Um, okay. <laughs> I have, I have just to start I, off with, huh? I can do that right away, but uh, I will have to acquire a, um, a culture for Foliotonomico. Uh, because it, it's kind of a fast growing mushroom. If you don't keep on top of it, it depletes its substrate and dies. And that's what happened to mine. So I don't have a viable foliota right uh -huh. now. But I can order one from, uh, from Kim or from uh, John yeah. Donahue. Uh, um, yeah. Northwest Michael. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lowell, have you noticed if there is any uh, particular advantage to using a mushroom compost? in fruiting, fruiting things. Uh, we, we, we really love English uh, uh, scarlet runner beans. They're the most delicious bean I have ever tasted. They're huge beans, they dry well uh, with a very meaty core. Uh, they, uh, they make the most delicious juicy pods for stir fry, especially uh, uh, Sichuan green beans, for instance, and and we 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 find that the the bean ex exhausts the soil very soon. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just curious if if uh, I wonder if the mushroom compost would help to replenish the soil and make them make it more uh, a viable substrate for uh, our favorite uh, scarlet runner beans. By the way, the the butterflies love the scarlet flowers too, and 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 the hummingbirds. So it, oh. it, it's a win-win-win. You know, it's the most beautiful. If you don't know about scarlet runner beans, you should look them up. They are marvelous, just incredible. We, Is it star runner bean? Scarlet. 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 Like the scarlet. Red color. Okay. Beautiful <laughs> red flowers. Uh, so they're just grow, incredible. Grow. They, and they grow like 8 to 10, 15 feet tall. You have to okay. make lots, lots of room. But they don't grow that way unless the soil is right. So that's mm -hmm. my question. Well, we, we grow our beans outdoors. And yeah. what we have done with our garden is uh, um, every, every year in the spring, or, well, in the fall too, we will till it and we'll till 
uh, spent mushroom kits into it. So we okay. have quite a few of them uh, that we've just mixed directly into the soil. Okay. Uh, the the worms go in there and de degenerate or you know break the break it down right in the garden. Uh, but we've had really good success with beans. But then our beans only get about knee high. We just grow a bush bean. Right. Well, the the scarlet runner is a, a freak of nature. It's probably the jack and the beanstalk. Beanstalk. <laughs> uh, it, it it really and the, it, and we grow them on on uh, on teepees. We we okay. we create teepees above them and and they grow you know ten feet tall and then they spread out above it and hang over. They're they're just the most marvelous bean in the world. I love. Them. Good, good, I, I, good I, I, I love. I love them as much as mushrooms. I swear. There's, there's so another good. really marvelous bean. It's called vortex. It doesn't vortex? have that great. Yeah, that great flowers, but it tastes better than a scarlet okay. runner. But the scarlet runner has the better blooms. Okay. Yes, yes, they're very good. Right, right. But a bean. Uh, any beans, they are also kind of nitrogen fixers. So they are yes, not really yes. depleting the soil that much themselves. But yeah. anything will grow better if you have a better soil. Right. Okay. Right. You know. Can I make my soil better with a horse uh, uh, manure? Not if that horse manure is not really good composted. <laughs> Right. It's fresh horse manure, you will have a big, big mistake because there is lots of grass seeds still in there and you will have no joy. And you don't want too much nitrogen or you will have more vine than bean. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. Um, the mushroom kits are the better option because yeah. they are not giving you anything bad. You should get a kit, eat the mushrooms and then you know, you get a second fruiting from it, most likely, because that's the thing Lowell didn't mention. You know, you, once I ate all those mushrooms off it, I'm not yet putting it into the compost. Uh -huh. It stands somewhere in the corner, marinates a bit for itself, and then, surprise, I'm not okay. putting them <laughs> Yes, yes. Okay. I'm so <laughs> Four times. Yeah. Wow. Then Okay, I'm jumping nice. on the bean bandwagon here. I grew um, the past three years two kinds of beans that uh, were absolutely fantastic. One was called Dragon's Tongue. Oh, yeah. It's yes. a flat bean. And the other one is Rattlesnake, which are great. And they're beautiful beans, but yeah. when you cook them, they kind of lose their mottled rattlesnake looking the but colors they, yeah they dry well um they're great as dried beans fresh beans they freeze well they're really tasty and i really like the flat dragon's tongue ones okay so lowell which is would you recommend as your best beginner mushroom kit good question <clears throat> it depends on the time of the year in the heat of the summer, I would start with the pink oyster mushroom or uh, one of the other tropical mushrooms, um, uh, dingri, um, uh, lentina sager, seju cajor, uh, the big brown oyster mushroom. Uh, this time of the year, uh, obviously the one that you have, Kirsten, the elm mm -hmm. oyster mushroom, yeah. uh, cold temperature tolerant. The uh, Ostriatus florida, does well in the cold temperature and uh, I am able to grow the blue cap oyster mushroom all year around. It's actually a spring or fall mushroom mm -hmm. but it tolerates heat and cold well enough that I can grow it into the summer and um, and into the winter. Yeah. So yes. I, I there might be one month in the winter and one month in the summer that I can't grow blue cap oyster mushrooms, but I have other mushrooms that I can grow then. But they're, they're the closest thing do I have to a year round mushroom. <coughs> mm -hmm. They're cool. also my best selling mushroom because if you sell that mushroom to a, a chef at a restaurant, um, it, you, you, you can bring you can bring other kinds of mushrooms, but eventually you'll say, uh, can you bring me more blue caps? Because they, 
they have pretty good success with uh, especially sauces and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think the blue cap is the world's best pizza mushroom. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh -huh. I love the Aringi. I really would like to have a whole garden full Aringi. <laughs> you know what would make it really easy to grow Aringii is if we have uh, somebody who makes beer. Mm. Uh -huh. The easiest way to grow the king oyster mushroom, um, when beer makers, they use this grain mixture, yeah. I don't know what they do with it, but they make it really, really hot, and then they cool it down, and as long as it's kept clean, you can inoculate it at that point without doing anything else with it. You don't have to pasteurize it or sterilize wow, it, wow, yeah. and they're done with it. It's ready to inoculate. And you get really profuse um, fruitings of uh, king oysters on. Okay, we on need that. To I, I forget what you call it. Is there a? <laughs> wow. It's beer. It's beer mash. There, you. Bob's a, happy. He loves breweries. <laughs> beer mash. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm wondering so whether that's so if during the fermentation or if it's after the. Yeah, put me together with a brewer and and we'll uh, between the two of us we'll get you some some king oysters. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Beer and mushroom. Otherwise, okay. king oysters don't grow well on straight straw, and uh, I I don't have a, a walk-in autoclave. I only have a pressure cooker, which is what you need to do wood chips and sawdust. So I have to do them in such small quantities that there's no profit in it. Um, but uh, a method that doesn't require sterilization, like the beer mash method, uh, I'm, I, I've been all over that. I mean, I can definitely grow enough inoculant to get it started. You should look into, I just ordered organic topsoil from Olympic in Polsbo, and they told me that 30% of the organic matter was beer making byproduct that they got from Kingston. So I think they're getting a large quantities from a brewery. Well, so we should figure out for you. We'll <laughs> figure out where we can get some of that, get our hands on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd have to have a heads up. So I have the inoculant ready when it shows up because yeah. if it sits around, it'll contaminate. Uh yeah, you have to make friends with the local um, little what's the other breweries, <laughs> micro brewery, local, local, yeah. local yeah. micro brewer, yeah. and yeah. know when yeah. the mash will be ready so that I can time the inoculant to be ready at the same time. I've got about you know, a three to six week window of opportunity once I make the inoculant to use it, but it's better to use it when it's young yeah. rather than at the end of six weeks. Yeah. Well, anybody? Good information. More questions? Thank you so much, Lowell. It was wonderful. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Road trip to Square. Thank you, Lowell. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. Thank you. It was great. Thank yeah. you, Kristen. I think it was well done. Tristan, lining it up. Okay. Yeah, we can put clapping in. <laughs> Thank you. This was very great. So now we have to make a trip back to you mm -hmm. <laughs> and get more cool. Okay. Yeah, you better give me Good a week night. to restock because uh, I'd be sold out if more than about two people. I know, I know. <laughs> kind of backfired now for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm but, glad you got mushrooms. I'm really glad those fruited so prolifically for you. Yes, yes. And I'm super happy too. Those look better than the ones in my grow room, so I'm jealous. <laughs> oh no, oh no. But yes, I left them be so that they look so beautiful. Yeah, uh, they look good. <laughs> anyway, so thank you very much, Lowell. This is awesome. Thank you. Our next meeting next month um, has as another interesting, more kind of towards the gardening um, subject. Um, presenter but it's also you know looking at what the mycelium is doing in the ground under us all the time and we don't even have a clue i think we need to know mm -hmm. 
So okay. I hope everybody can be participating at the next Zoom meeting as well. All right, stay safe. Don't slide in the snow, but go outside and enjoy the snow. It's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> all Thank right. you. Good night. Good night. Thank you all. Bye. Okay. Bye. Stop the recording. Stop the recording.